One verse of scripture. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'd do good to this congregation. Your blessings would be upon them. Oh, God, your word would penetrate our hearts, do good to our souls. Lord, we're in living in momentous times. The devil knows he has but a short time, Lord. God, we're facing an adversity, ad- adversary that is angry with the saints of God. Lord, angry at the church of Jesus. And I pray for power to overcome, Lord. Pray that the word of God would be sown in our hearts. The anointing of God would be upon me. Lord, you'd bless the congregation. Give us strength to overcome. Help us, Lord, not to be those, among those that just barely survive. But I pray that you'd help us to be strong and able to help others. And we'll give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I'd like to speak to you for a few minutes on the backslider in heart. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and with the fruit of his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Backsliding is a reality. Really, it'd be hard to deny that if you've had any experience in life. It'd be hard to deny that backsliding is a reality. And we have seen that. You know, we, we believe that it's possible. We don't believe in doing it, but we believe it's possible. And, and we sure don't want to encourage it. We want to encourage people to be faithful to God. And, and, and you know, we don't want to just uh, preach as if we expect people to backslide. We expect people to be strong. We expect people to overcome because God has given us grace And everything we need that we can be more than conquerors through him that loved us. But we do believe that backsliding is possible. And we have seen a lot of people backslide. It's always a great tragedy when someone backslides on God. But there are degrees of backsliding. backsliding. There are those who have backslidden to the point that they no longer maintain any semblance of religion. But the backslider in heart is that person who retains the outward forms of religion, but who is in the process of dying within. They are the backslider in heart. There's a decay going on in the inner being of that backslider in heart. And there's usually something that triggers that process of backsliding. Some catastrophe, some tragedy, some uh, a crisis in life that often triggers the process of backsliding, that turns that person's heart, where that person was seeking God, loving God, serving God joyfully, but some crisis, some tragedy, some catastrophe, something unexpected in life. And all of a sudden, something inside of them changes. And they begin to change direction in their life. Oh, brother, I've seen it happen so often in the lives of people that I have pastored and preached to. It's broken my heart. And sometimes... It's, it's, you know, it's like that man that uh, maybe Brother Ryan Rawson told me about. The, uh, the Navy SEALs, you know, they go through a, a week of, of, of testing. They call it, well, it's a terrible name they call it, but it's a, a week where they, they put them through severe tests to see if they have got the mental ability and the physical stamina to, to live up to the standards of a Navy SEAL. They get very little sleep. They they go through strenuous exercises in water, in climbing, in swimming, in in all kinds of exercises that put their bodies to the limit. But the, the, the main thing in a Navy SEAL is not his physical strength, but his mental strength. That is the main thing in a Navy SEAL is his mental strength. And those boys, they, there's a bunch of them goes into that training, but there's only a few of them that come out and finish it. 
And they, was, they were in the midst of this training. The boy in the group that was the strongest one. The one that had the greatest physical ability. But in the midst of that strenuous training and testing, he reached a point to where he decided he was going to give up and turn himself in. So he, he, he walked away from the group. And the man that was in charge, one of the men in charge, saw him going to turn himself in and give up. And he thought that he'd go there and talk him out of it. And the main man said, don't go talk him out of it. Don't go try to talk him out of it. There's something broken on the inside of him. If you talk it out of him today, tomorrow he'll be back reporting in and giving up. So I've seen that happen in people in the house of God. Something broke on the inside. And all the efforts we made, we could not rescue those souls. And brother, there's something that takes place in our hearts. We meet a crisis, a disappointment, a tragedy. Somebody does us wrong. And all of a sudden, something turns on the inside of us. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Focused within, focused on himself, loses sight of the bigger picture. And now he lives his life focused on himself. It may be a wounded spirit that turns that heart away from God. A major disappointment in life that turns that heart away from God. Perhaps an, a worldly opportunity presents itself. And there have been many people that were presented with worldly opportunities that they knew would lead them away from God and away from the house of God. But the appeal of that, the pull of that, turned their heart away from God. And they made a decision that they had rather have what the world could offer them than to have what they could find in the house of God. It turned them in their hearts. A situation of prosperity. A man that's lived his life in poverty. A man that struggled all of his life. And overnight, his fortunes change. And he's, he's given prosperity. And he's given a, a good job. And he's now got plenty of money. And, and, and it turns his heart away from God. It's crises in life. A tragedy. A chronic illness sometimes. Turns people's hearts away from God. People that have been in this church. I remember a man that came to this church. And uh, his daughter went through a tragedy. And something happened on the inside of him. It turned his heart away from God. I want you to know that the devil is watching for a vulnerable moment in your life. You hear me? I said the devil is watching for a vulnerable moment in your life to turn your heart away from God. It happens sometimes in the house of God. We've had problems in the house of God, disputes and conflicts in the house of God, and there are souls lost right now because of conflicts in this place. People that had conflicts in the house of God, and it turned people away from the house of God. You know, it's really critical that you understand that when you decide to cause some trouble in the house of God, somebody's likely to be lost as a result of that. And that's the reason that the Bible says that we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're to endeavor, we're to work hard to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Hallelujah. You see, the unity of God's people is the work of the Spirit of God. We can't create unity. The Spirit does. He centers us all around Jesus Christ, makes us loyal to the Son of God. And anybody that can get along with Jesus, if you get along with Jesus and I get along with Jesus, there's no reason why we can't get along together. Hallelujah. And, you know, the devil, he, he seeks these opportunities to knock somebody out of the saddle. He seeks these opportunities to discourage somebody, to turn somebody's heart away from God. The devil is watching for those vulnerable moments in life. Young people are particularly susceptible to these things. Young people whose hearts 
are tender and, and, and they're impressionable and they expect so much out of the people of God. And when they don't see that happen, oftentimes it turns their heart away from God. It can happen in the home if they see, are disappointed in the home and mom and daddy's spirituality. Or it could happen in the church when they see disappointment in the preacher or in the people in the pew. It turns their heart away from God. Oh my, how critical it is that we, we realize that we don't live to ourselves. We don't die to ourselves. That we have an influence on other people. It matters how we live. It matters how we conduct ourselves. It matters. Our life affects other people. And the devil is watching for that vulnerable moment in the life of susceptible individuals to turn their heart away from God. Backsliding always begins in the heart. Hebrews 3 and 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The prodigal son went to his father and said, Father, I want you to give me the portion of my inheritance. And his father granted his request. The prodigal son, not many days afterwards, left home and went to a far country. But already in his heart, When he went and made the request to Father, give me the portion of my inheritance, his heart was already turned away from home. And, you know, there may be somebody right here in this service tonight. Your heart is already turned away from God. Something in your life has pulled your heart away from God. And turns you away from the ways of God, the people of God, the word of God. This prodigal son, his heart was already in the far country, but his feet followed his heart. And I want to tell you, brother, wherever your heart is, your feet's going to follow your heart. And this young man's heart was already in the far country, and it wasn't long until his feet followed his heart. Demas was a man that was a fellow laborer with the Apostle Paul. Paul referred to him in his writings as my fellow laborer. Later on, he says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Something happened to this man. Somewhere along the way, this companion of the Apostle Paul, this fellow soldier, this fellow laborer with the Apostle Paul, something turned his heart. Something got his attention out there in the world. Something captured his affection. Something got his mind distracted from God and Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul was devastated over the loss of this man. Demas, a man that was once faithful to God, and a man who ran into the arms of the world. You know, that's such a tragedy to see a person that once loved God rush into the arms of a waiting world that embraces them. The world that crucified the Lord of glory. The world that hates the Christians. The world that despises the Savior of the world. And to watch a person, you talk about a traitor, brother, to watch a person walk away from God, rush into the arms of the world, the same world that crucified the Lord of glory. How do you think Paul felt about this? He's, he's, it's a tragedy to him that Demas, who once labored with me, is now in the arms of the world. Backsliding bears unmistakable signs. It must be detected in order to be corrected. Sometimes we deceive ourselves. Did you know you can deceive yourself? Does the Bible Bible just say uh, about people deceiving themselves? If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. 
So we can deceive ourselves. We can, we can think we are better off than we are. Wasn't that the problem of the Apostle Peter when he said to Jesus, Jesus, I'll go with you even unto death. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, you're overestimating yourself. Before the cock, 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 cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter overestimated. He did not understand the weakness in him. Jesus saw it. Jesus saw the weakness in him. He predicted what he was going to do. You're going to deny me. Peter said, I won't do that, Lord. Not me. Oh, sometimes we overestimate ourselves. Hear me now. The Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Be careful, brother. Search your heart. Let God search your heart and see if there be a weakness inside of you. Jesus saw the weakness in Peter that he didn't realize himself. We can deceive ourselves, but there are unmistakable signs of backsliding. Look at Laodicea. Jesus sent this message to Laodicea. He said, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Did you know that mild religion is reprehensive to God? I said mild religion is reprehensive to God. You, you can't be a spent straddler and please God. You've got to make a the choice. Young man, young lady, man, mother and father, you have got to make a choice. You cannot be a fence straddler and please God. God finds lukewarmness detestable. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Mild religion never did anything for God. And I'm telling you, brother, it won't get you to heaven either. You've got to be on fire for God. God sent them a critique of their spiritual life. You say, I am rich. I am increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And God said, here's what I think about you. You are wretched and miserable and poor and blind. Oh my, look at how God saw them. In comparison to how they saw themselves. And I ask you tonight. Are you honest with God? Are you honest with God about your own spiritual state? Are you willing for God to search your heart? Are you willing for God to put His finger on your life? Are you willing for God to point out in your life those things that that are critical to your spiritual well-being? I want to ask you some questions. Are you as grateful right now to be saved as you ever were? Are you just as thankful right now that God rolled the burden of sin away as you ever were? I want you to understand something here tonight. If you're not thankful to be saved, you won't be saved very long. If you are not grateful that God rescued you, if you do not remember from where God brought you from and the misery you were in before God saved you, you'll go back to the slop if you're not thankful for what God delivered you from it. You'll be like the dog returning to his vomit and the hog returning to the mire, brother, if you're not thankful for where God brought you from. Listen to the people of Israel after God brought them out of Egypt. And they run into a little trouble. And they're saying, we miss the onions and the garlics and the leeks of Egypt. And we're going to make a captain to take us back down. They forgot about the whip. They forgot about the seven days of labor. They forgot about the fact that they were miserable. Their children had no hope. They were slaves. Their children were going to be slaves. There was no hope for them. They forgot about the tragedy of their life. Hey, brother, I'm telling you, you'll never backslide as long as you're thanking God that He saved your soul. Hallelujah. I'm glad, brother. I'm telling you, I'm not sad to be saved. I am not sad God delivered me. Hallelujah. I'm happy tonight that God forgave me of my sins and and delivered me from my past. You'll backslide if you stop praising God. 
You start looking back. Jesus said, He that putteth his hand to the plow and looketh back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Oh, brother, when you put your hand to the plow, don't be looking back. Don't be yearning for what God delivered you from. Be happy that God set you free. Be thankful that God delivered you. And keep on praising God. Hallelujah. And I ask you something else. Do you still hate sin? You know, when you get saved, God changes your attitude towards sin. You'd never get saved otherwise. As long as you love sin, you will never get saved. It's when you realize the danger of sin, the deadly nature of sin, what sin is doing in your life. That's what turns us away from sin. As a 13-year-old boy, experimenting with sin, with the knowledge of what's right and doing what was wrong, I couldn't stop myself, it seemed like. In spite of all my good intentions, and there was something drawing me into the world, some, a curiosity about sin. My parents had built a hedge about me, but there was something inside of me that wanted to breach that hedge, that wanted to cross that line, that wanted to find out what's beyond the limitations my parents has put on my life. I wanted to know what the world was all about. There was a curiosity, a deadly curiosity in my heart that was driving me into the world. And Jesus came and rescued my soul. As a 13-year-old boy, conviction came upon my heart. And He made me realize the deadliness of sin, the danger that sin had exposed me to the wrath of God, and and I prayed until God forgave me of my sin and rolled that burden of sin away. I'm telling you, brother, God gave me a different attitude towards sin. I want to ask you the question, do you still hate sin? Now this is what causes churches to backslide. This is what has brought whole denominations to backsliding. Is they no longer have the same attitude about sin. Years ago I preached a revival in the denomination, a church not too far from here. And there was an old-fashioned woman. Well, she's an older woman. I hope she was old-fashioned. But she talked to me one night and she told me, she said, Now, you know... I don't do so and so, but my son does so and so, and and you know I don't like it, but you know they have to, and so forth and so on, and this sort of excusing the sin of the children. When you get to the point to where sin does not look too bad to you because your children are involved in it, or some loved one is involved in it, so it don't look too bad anymore. You don't hate it like you used to hate it. You don't despise it like you used to despise it. Brother, sin will begin to appeal to you if you lose your hatred of sin. And I'll tell you, the devil is working over time to convince us that sin's not quite as bad as you thought it was. Are y'all still with me? I'll ask you another question. Do you still love the house of God? Can you say with David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Do you still love the house of God? I read a book not long ago about why men hate to go to church. And there was really some good things in there. But I got to thinking about that thing. You know, it said, well, men, they don't, they're not too good at singing and, and all the things that go in the church. If they're not involved in the music and they, you know, they're not too good at singing, not too good at expressing themselves. Women are better able to express themselves and they testify better and so on and so forth. And so the men's just sort of left out. I got through reading that book. I saw through that, brother. I saw through that. I know the devil's trying to give every man an excuse for not going to the house of God. 
We don't come here to be seen or to be heard. We come here to give glory and honor to Jesus Christ. And everybody can do that, brother. You can worship God. I tell you, this is the main business that goes on here, is that we worship God in the beauty of holiness. We worship God in spirit and in truth. This is the main business that goes on in the assembly of God's people. And everybody has an opportunity to worship God, whether you be man or woman. You can still worship God. Hallelujah. The reason men don't come to the house of God is because they no longer have a worship in their heart. But I'll tell you, when you've got a worship in your heart, this is the place you want to be. You can say, well, David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It don't matter whether you can sing good or not. It don't matter whether you can play an instrument. That don't matter at all. We come to the house of God to give God glory and to give God honor. We come to the house of God to be instructed in righteousness. I want to tell you, it really matters your attitude toward the man of God. Because, listen, if you, if you fall out with me, you ain't going to hear nothing I say. It matters that your attitude toward me. Oh, yeah. I ain't nothing. I ain't perfect. I know that. I know all of that. You don't have to tell me. I know it. <laughs> I know all of that. But when you go to your home and you chew up the preacher... In front of your children, your wife, your husband, you are helping to send them to hell. We come to the house of God to be instructed out of the Word of God. And I want to tell you, brother, if you don't hear what God has to say to you, you decide I'm just going to stay at home, read my Bible, I'll do without the people of God, I'll do without the preaching of the Word of God, you will perish, brother. You hear me? You will perish. Because God is ordained to save the world through the foolishness of preaching, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Hallelujah. Now, if you don't like me, if you think, well, that preacher, you know, he's just... Uh, Got all kind of problems. You go find you a perfect pastor. Then go tell, come back and tell me about him. Maybe I'll go. Do I still love the house of God? Is it still important to me to hear the preaching of the Word of God? Is it still critical to me to be instructed out of the Word of God? Is it important to me for God to put His finger on my life? Is it important for me to me that God rebuke me and chasten me and reprove me and encourage me and instruct me from the Word of God? Can I say with David, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Do I love the Word of God like I once loved the Word of God? Can we say with Job, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food? How important is the Word of God to you? How important is the Bible to you? I'm talking about unmistakable signs of backsliding. Am I still willing to sacrifice for the Lord? Sacrifice in giving, sacrifice in time, sacrifice in devoting to people that need help. Am I still willing to sacrifice for Jesus? Am I will listen, you know, love makes you willing to sacrifice. If you love that wife and you love that husband, you are willing to sacrifice to please them. And the Bible tells us. This is the mark of those that love the Lord. We take up our cross daily. We deny ourselves. And we follow the Lord. That is the mark of God's people. Are you willing to sacrifice for the Lord? Is there still joy in your service for God? Do you still have a backbone for God? 
that you are willing to stand up for what is right and what is truth, whatever it costs you. In your family, in your, on your job, you're willing to do what is right, whatever it costs you. You still have that boldness. You still have that commitment. There's something inside of you that never has broke. There's a commitment that never has broken under the pressure. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own way. Everybody else's fault. If only this person, if only that circumstance, it's somebody else's fault. It's somebody, it's the circumstances of life. And you know, if, if you were in my circumstances, you, you couldn't live right either. As one man told me, I don't believe anybody can work in a cotton mill and live right. Well, there have been people worked in cotton mills and live right. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. So we're filled with our own ways, focused on ourselves. We, we feel like, you know, our, our situation is unique. Nobody's walked this road before. Nobody's been down this road before. My situation's unique. I have a right to backslide. I have a right to lay out of church. I have a right to not pray. I have a right to neglect the Bible. See how God's treated me? I'm unique. You're not unique. There hath no temptation take the temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Be sober, be vigilant. The devil, your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that's in the world. Somebody has walked the road your own. There are footsteps on the path you're on. You're not unique. You're not alone. Somebody has been down that road and overcome and kept the faith and, and kept the victory. You are not unique. There's no, listen to me now. There is no excuse for backsliding. None. No excuse for backsliding. But there is a remedy for backsliding. The Lord told Israel, He said, if you turn away from God, if you are taken into captivity, if from thence, if from your captivity, you will seek the Lord thy God, God will hear you, God will answer, God will restore you, if from your place of captivity, if from that place of sorrow, if from that place of backsliding, you will turn to God and you will begin to seek God, God will hear you, brother. I'm telling you, God desires to save the backslider. Oh, hallelujah. I said, God desires to save the backslider. He made a promise to Israel, if you will seek the Lord thy God, if from your captivity, if from the place that God, that you have, that, that, that your backsliding has taken you, if from that place you will seek God, he said, if you will seek me with your whole heart, you will find me, he said. That's the promise of God, you'll find me. I'm telling you, it's time to rally around the cross. It's time to renew our commitment to Jesus. It's time for the people of God to get rid of the distractions that are destroying their love for God. Brother, we're to warn them that are unruly. We're to comfort the feeble-minded, which means to rally those that are faint-hearted. And there may be some right here in this house tonight faint-hearted. Something's happened inside. Some disappointment. Some crisis. Some tragedy. That's 
turned our hearts away from God. But if from where you are, you will begin to call on the Lord, God said, you'll find Him. You'll find Him. You'll find the Lord tonight. He'll answer the heart cry of a soul that's missing Him. You hear me? He will hear the heart cry of a soul that's missing Him. God will answer your prayer. Sister Judy, if you'll come to the piano. I remember talking to a backslider some years ago. This man told me, he said, every day of my life, I thought about the Lord. Every day in my backslidden state, I couldn't get my mind off the Lord. I remembered what I used to be, what God had done for me. And in that backslidden condition, God finally got a hold of him. He had a dream. In his dream, he said he was standing in an automobile repair shop. And there were some automobiles there in this shop. One of them in particular, the hood was raised. And there were some auto mechanics standing around looking at the motor of this automobile. And he said on the walls were these plaques, you know, master automotive technicians and so forth. And and he, he walked up to this automobile. He looked in at that motor. He said it was a mess, tangled mess, this motor in this car. And he said the, the, the automobile mechanics were looking at it and they were shaking their heads like it's hopeless. There's nothing we can do. And he said all of a sudden, out of a side door like an office on the side, there was a man that opened the door and walked out. He had nail scars in his hands. He walked over to that car, looked in at that motor, and said, I can fix it. Praise God. I can fix it. And I want to tell you, when everybody else is shaking their head and saying that's a hopeless case, Mm -hmm. as somebody with nails, scars in his hands, that walks over and takes a look, and says, I can fix it. And I promise you, whatever's wrong tonight, Jesus can fix it. I want us to stand together tonight. If the Lord has spoken to you, don't hesitate. Fall in this altar. <laughs> Let Jesus fix it tonight.